start by describing what the stock is and what it is not about. Uh, this is my second uh, talk here at the Function Council. I was here last year also. And uh, last year too, I had spoken about something I had been doing in Erlang. Whereas last year's talk was about something I was trying at work. This is something I'm trying on my own time. So this is an experience report. How many of you here uh, are not computer science students? How many? Okay, enough to get a sense of what I'm going to do. So I'm a programmer by profession. I've been programming for a while now, about uh, 15 years or more. And, uh, but I was trained as a mechanical engineer. So programming is something I picked up on my own. And while I haven't reasonably uh, reasonable at it, So every now and then I pick up these computer science books and I make an attempt to go through them with, uh, with varying degrees of success. And this time I decided to program my way through it. And since I was also uh, dabbling in Erlang, I chose to do so in Erlang. So this is an experience report of what I have tried in Erlang and my journey of learning computer science while trying to implement some of the stuff, computer architecture while trying to implement some of it. So this is not an introduction to Erlang. So if you're not familiar with Erlang, then this is not an introduction. Uh, this is definitely not an introduction to functional programming. It is not meant to be an introduction to computer architecture, but uh, I'll still walk you through some of this stuff so that it gives some context about what I try and what I have been doing. Okay, I work, uh, my grandiose title is director of engineering software. I'm the programmer as part. I manage work I use mostly Java and Scala, a bit of Perl, Python, R, and some Erlang. Uh, if you were here in 2016, uh, you probably would have heard my story about how that bit of Erlang came into my work. Uh, what I found in the intervening years since 2015 is that Erlang is uh, very hard to hire for, at least in Bangalore, and uh, it is hardest to convince people. For instance, uh, let's say you're using Java, uh, you pick up IntelliJ IDEA, and that's about all your tools in one one basket. Whereas you start with Erlang, while uh, the language holds great promise, uh, you have to look around. Somebody suggests rebar, somebody suggests eunit, uh, then how do you deploy it, and so on. And so on. While the tools are there, I mean, there is no one single package that keeps you everything nicely. In fact, uh, Okay, starting with editor, there are decent plugins for IntelliJ and so on, but many people still prefer to use Not that Emacs is a bad editor, but these are the challenges. Uh, a bit about my employer, Perfia. <coughs> we have a product, uh, we have a suite of products which are in the financial space. We started off as a mint clone for it. Where you could track your person. That was about seven, eight years ago. From then we, we've grown to offer uh, a suite of products. I'll tell you a bit of the product I am heading. How many of you here have applied for a loan? There you go. We submit a bunch of documents which uh, are meant to prove who you are and then assess your uh, credit worthiness or income. Perfuse has largely automated this process where you submit bank documents, bank statements, a company financial statements in case you are institutional lender. We process it, analyze it, and then give you a report which suits that particular customer. We have about 120 customers. Most of India's private banks are our customers. So if you apply for a loan from, let's say, Kotak Bank, Bajaj, Fitz, uh, <coughs> HDFC, and so on, a good chance that your application goes through our process. About 100,000. Okay. Enough about purpose. Uh, let's come to computer architecture. Uh, I started my quest uh, using one of the classic books of computer architecture, uh, Andrew S. Tannenbaum, Structured Computer Organization. Uh, in my case, I used the fourth edition because that's what I had. At the Later editions have come out. Computer architecture. Uh, Tannenbaum defines it as consisting of multiple levels. And these are the six levels, the classic levels. 
there is some interlap between them. These are not set in stone, even though the first three more or less seems to be stable. Whereas level four, five, and six, uh, you have a great amount of variance. I have worked through the first level, uh, completed the second level also, and I am in the process of completing the third level. I am yet to complete uh, the other. Level. So the talk will largely focus on the first level as well as uh, the code. The code that I am going to show you, the papers that I am going to show you, will also focus on the first level. So any any questions? So let's start with the digital logic level. The digital logic is the simplest level. It is effectively one level above the electronic physics. So you have these gates. I am sure that uh, all of you would have heard of the almighty NAND group. These devices are essentially uh, linear, or rather they are, they are uh, not digital. But using them, you can reliably collapse functions. A gate is not a digital entity. A gate is very much uh, a non-digital entity. But using it, you can reliably build Common gates are. Uh, I'm sure that most of you have seen these pictures. So the, the NAND gate is the NAND gate is particularly uh, considered the mother gate, just for the simple reason that it's easy to fabricate and that all the other gates can be made of. This is again computer architecture 101. I'm just talking into this. So that's the digital. Level. Everything consists of a bunch of gates. You put them together in different combinations. You get combinator with circuit, and then you add more and more on top of those circuits until you get to the next level. So let us look at the uh, next level, which is uh, micro architecture. Once you reach micro architecture, things become a bit more interesting. At micro architecture level, you have local starting with a one bit all the way up to your 32 bit register. Then you have the heart of your computer, an arithmetic and logic processing unit. You can again start with a one bit area and go all your way up to 32 or 60 or any number of bits. Then uh, you have registers and then you have the ALU. These are connected together in what is called the data path. In fact, that's going to be one of the key things that we'll talk about. The data path is essentially what goes into the ALU and what goes into Where does it come from and where does it get stored after it is calculated? That is the gist of the data. The typical operation is something like this. An ALU has two inputs and one output. There are other bits and pieces that come in and go out. But for most practical cases, there are two inputs and one output. You can load these two inputs from a variety of registers, and then you can perform an operation, and the output of that operation can be stored in a variety of registers. So any operation is typically, uh, the, the process is something like, identify which registers do the operands come from, send them through the ALU, let it finish the computation, look at the output, decide which register should the outcome be stored in, perform that operation. That is the gist of a data path operation. These operations are controlled by what is called a microprogram. Now, microprograms these days are embedded directly in the hardware. But from a student's perspective, it makes sense to look at them not as an abstract, but rather look at them in detail so that you actually understand what they are. So if you buy a modern machine, chances are that your microprogram is already there, baked into the but from my experience process, I did to go in and then look at how the microprogram was done in a classical fashion. And in the book that I refer to, Tannenbaum, uh, he actually spells out the program and then he builds a subset of the JVM, the JVM, the integer from the JVM on top. What are microprograms? It's effectively an interpreter for the level about. In fact, that that is a pattern that you see throughout in the Every level acts as an interpreter or maybe a translator for the level above. In some cases, there are interpreters. In some cases, there are translators or compilers. But effectively, each level talks to the level below and then it can talk that language. So in this 
case, your microprogram essentially understands what is being said in every single bar and it talks to the middle and it does a bunch of things. Let's take an app operation. Actually, you fetch things, you find out the operands, you load them into registers. When you say fetch operands, instruction, it comes from a particular part of the main memory called the microprogram store. Then you fetch the operands, which comes from the memory, you load them into the operands. Sum is computed by the ALU, and the result is routed to a register or memory application. So this is the data path in all its glory. So quick question, how many can recall the names of all the registers? I, I keep forgetting. So, you know, CCV and I'm picking C++. No, that's not what it is. So it's a constant good point. LV is not last name. Anyway, so how this is this is the data. Now, what trips up some people, it tripped me up, is that you forget that this is not a combinatorial search. Whereas, while these things are built up of combinatorial search, it is not a combinatorial search where you apply the values and your output is ready like that. These things, it's more like an orchestra where somebody has to coordinate the orchestra. You have a beginning, and then you have an end, and you have several things distinct happening. In the These distinct steps are performed by combinatorial search, but there is a definite gap in between. You know, things don't get over like in, in like, uh, uh, or rather, the moment you get the values, or rather, if you try to make it instantaneous, then you get corrupted by the order. So it has to be sequent, loading the registers and into the bus. That has to be step one. Then you ask the ALU to do its job. Then you wait for the output to stabilize in the output. Then you push the output maybe into the same register. So that is a sequencing operation. And that kind of trips people up. It took me up. Tandem DOM is this classic picture. We'll come back to this. So effectively, you have a conductor or a, uh, an orchestrator who is responsible for making sure that these things happen. The talk is nothing but an entity which goes uh, tick. Effectively, it gives a tick, which is what is happening here, and then it goes stuck again. Between the tick and the talk, uh, several things happen. How do you model that? So that's our question. The faster your ticks and talks, the more things can be accomplished in a given period of time. So over, over the years, your tick talks have gone from 1 megahertz all the way to 3.5 gigahertz. So you have that and it, and it continues to increase, which means your, your machines are capable of achieving more and more uh, with time. Keep these things in mind. We'll come back to this. Because when, you come, when it comes down to programming, when you try to program this, these things become relevant, particularly in order. This is the go repair of the whole thing being orchestrated. So you have a control store there. It sends out a particular signal. It's like some 40 bits or so. which tells you each part what to do. For example, there are 6 plus 2, 8 controls which tell ALU which option to perform and any additional options need to be performed after the ALU, like shifting it right the right There are other, uh, for example, there is a bus control at the far right, B. It controls what goes into the B bus. So these are the names, if you can, don't remember them. Interestingly, OPC, even Tannenbaum was very evasive. He said it's a scratch register, you can use it for a bunch of things. There was no definitive name about you know, what do these three letters Old program counter seems favored, but there is a very categorical name that I'd like to know. Now, how does the ALU know what to do? The ALU gets uh, six bits in and two out as dub control. Those six bits control uh, what it does. Now each of those six bits represents a function of the ALU. Uh, let's take the first one, just for example. You have uh, the first two bits are effectively a uh, it's a classic decoder where it tells you what to do. Then each of the inputs is the input 
A enabled, second input enabled, should the input be inverted? Is there an in increment or a carry? If this is the particular sequence, then all it does is take the A value in and then output the A value. Don't worry about what, why, you know, why would you do that? Never mind that. But that is what it can do. It can do an A plus 1, B plus 1, A plus B and so on. A or B and secondly, you, have, you can form a four different functions. A and B, A or B, uh, not B, and then uh, A plus B. These are the options that you can do. And with a little jugglery, you can do a bunch of uh, things around. There are about uh, 16 functions. Now, on top of this comes the instruction set architecture, which is effectively, if you buy a chip and you get a manual with it, whatever it says in there, typically is uh, this case. And uh, this is, uh, these are the instructions which are carried out interpretively by the microplane, or in these days, by the hardware. But for our, for the, for the purpose session, we'll consider that these are Don't worry too much about it, but this is just to give you an idea of what is available and what is possible. So everything is identified by a hex code, and then you have a name uh, and text what it does. Third level is called the OS machine level. Now, I'm, I'm a bit confused here as in, because this is traditionally the OS level, but it's not the OS as we know it. It's not probably the Linux. This is like one level below. We understand the OS as a Windows or a Linux, but this is not that. So you have uh, the ability to run two or more programs concurrently. Does that sound familiar? No, we are, we are not there in the Erlang land yet, but we can do stuff. And then uh, you have more var variation in design. Whereas the chip level and the first level, doesn't matter which CPU you're looking at, it is broadly the same. But from level two or level three onward, the number of variations you know, increases drastically. So uh, level fours and higher, level four and higher are intended for applications. So if you're writing assembly or if you're writing C or any of these modern languages, you're fit to level four or higher. So level four is typically assembly. Level five is all these high-level programming languages. Uh, Tannenbaum doesn't mention Erlang. He mentions basic C, C++. But Erlang fits into the level five. Whereas level one, two, and three rely on numeric uh, languages. Level four and five usually have word and phrases which make more sense to humans. Uh, level four is an assembly language. It's again, uh, you know, all these things cascade down. The level five is converted to level four, gets converted to level three, which gets uh, interpreted as level two and so on. Okay. High level languages, hundreds of them exist. And uh, the programs are translated into level 3 and 4, and these translators are generally called compilers. There are uh, level 5 languages which do use interpreters. But anyway, this is all for. Uh, so let's come to the crux of the problem. Uh, how do we go about implementing this? Let's start at the simplest level. How do you implement a gate? Any any thought? How do you implement a gate? Uh, how do you implement a gate in the language of your choice? Java, C++. I just want an AND gate or an AND gate. You write a function. So in fact, that's what I did. So I started with the function. Uh, once you have a function, then you can compose them. You can do a bunch of stuff with them. Next comes the level. One, the data path, microcontroller, and then I guess we'll come back to that. Let's start with gates. Now, when I started with Erlang, my first thing was to use the atoms, but true and false, which I used as binary values in Erlang to write the functions. It, it has certain advantages. First of all, uh, Erlang is not statically typed, but if you use true and false, then you get an additional degree of type safety. Otherwise, you have to, uh, you know, we'll, we'll
we'll see why. The true and false makes it very clear. You are only accepting two values, and uh, you are not accepting any numbers. Your guards become easier and stuff. But the problem with true and false is that they do not map to the domain. I couldn't find a single textbook where true and false are used. Maybe when I was explaining Boolean algebra, they were talking in terms of true and false. But very quickly things would convert to go into zero. Domain. So to map, to match the domain and to remove that additional overhead of thinking in terms of true and false and then converting to zero and one, uh, I switched to zero and one. So my function had zero and one. So zero and one gives you the advantage that it's domain friendly. It's, uh, but however, you cannot use the built in order. If you want to do an and of zero and one, you can't. Uh, whereas an and of true and false, there are built in operators in our language. Zero and one, you have to uh, invent your own right function, and, so and your guards become a bit more complex. I'll show you a snippet of code which you know to illustrate more. Then I went, uh, then I went ahead and said, fine, I'll write one function per gate for an AND, an XOR, and so on. The second approach is to write an AND, and then use an AND to build the other. So let's take a look at some code. So I have written uh, five gates here. These are the classic gates. I have an AND gate, I have an AND gate, a NOT gate, OR gate, and XOR gate. Uh, let's start with the NAND gate since it's the mother gate. I've chosen to implement the gates uh, separate rather than using a composition of NAND. So this is my uh, truth table. Thanks to pattern matching and uh, function heads, I can write it pretty much like as though I was writing the truth table. So writing them, testing them is very straightforward. I haven't used any guards because this is pretty much, even though there is, a, there is no static typing, this pretty much make sure that at runtime things will be caught and then things will crash. This will not always hold true as we'll see in a few minutes. This is a, a more uh, refined approach where I define the gates in terms of other gates. Now here I have a problem. I don't want to spell out four heads for the AND because I'm going to invoke an AND gate internally, which means I'm obliged to use variables. I can't put one and zero. Otherwise, I have to repeat the whole thing again and again. Whereas bo body of the function remains unchanged, which means I have to put guards. And the guards are cumbersome. A and B are integers. Well, they are integers, but they are very specific integers. This is not a Haskell where I can say, you know, A is either zero or one. So I, I have to put all these very cumbersome guards to make sure that you know, the client code which calls this passes over. Once I do that, I can go to the NAND gate, and the NAND gate will take care. And uh, here are the other gates implemented in terms of the NAND. Okay. Go back to our. Okay. okay, that was easy. Let's more in. I mean, let's get deeper in one minute. Or two. How do you? If 
the circuit is simple enough, I can compose functions like I did with the NAND gate. But as the circuit becomes more complex, I am obliged to have connections. These wires that lead from one part of the circuit to another. Let's look at another one. This is a half adder and that's a full adder. You can see the individual gates. But do you see these joints? The same input is shared by a bunch of gates. And then there one of the output goes to another gate. When you are composing functions, this is not easy to pull out. Whereas if the outputs naturally map, it's okay. But the moment an output is shared between uh, two different gates, you have to store it in a variable. Plus, function composition works for combinatorial circuits. But how do you represent memory? Memory by its nature, which means there is an element of time. How do you represent that in a function? A function by nature cannot hold state. I mean, for it to be a pure function. I mean, Java folks may disagree, but uh, your function cannot hold state. That is one problem. Another problem is that many gates have, as I mentioned now, they have different inputs. How do you connect those inputs? How do you, for instance, uh, your ALU, if you find the picture, this is your one bit ALU. Uh, look at this OR gate. It's not two inputs, it's four inputs. In fact, there are cases where you have n number of inputs which are odd together and many have others that come. How do you represent that? So, let's go ahead and run another course. Here. Here is my one bit ALU. Can you see that? This is my one bit ALU represented as a pure function. It gets these many inputs, it uses variables to compute various things, and then it gives you the output and the time. You can combine n number of these to build a ripple carry uh, ALU. You can have a 16 bit ALU or 32 bit ALU. We won't be doing that, we directly jump to 32 bit, but this is your function. At one bit, this works because an ALU still is a common total. It doesn't hold any memory. There is no time bound temporal. So I can pull this up. So effect, uh, I'm not going to explain this in detail. But effectively you have, you know, whatever I showed you in the last picture is what is being done. You have a decoder, you have a logical unit, you have a full adder, and then finally uh, you use an out OR gate and then data path. Why do we need clocks? How do we represent clocks in this? I hope everybody remembers why do we need clocks. Now how do you represent clocks in this? And how do you represent all these temperatures? So my solution was to use a process holding a state to represent some of the clocks. So your bus is effectively a process. Its state is a name, not really needed, but uh, used for, you, know, you can use some other variable also. For a human, from a human perspective I said, I thought name meant made more sense. It has a width, it could be a 32-bit bus, it could be an 8-bit controlled bus and so on, and it holds a name. A register, similarly, you have a name, you have some buses attached to it, and it holds a name. An ALU, which is a 32-bit ALU, it doesn't really need state, but it needs state in this case because it needs to keep track of which buses it is attached to. And then clock signals are modeled as this. In fact, we have a tick and a talk. It's slightly more complicated than a tick and a talk, but in fact, that's what happens. So let's take a quick look at bus clock. So this is my bus. I have used the gen server behavior of online to make it easy to create processes which hold state. So I have a bus, I can initiate a bus which will call gen server, keep track of the name and the width of the bus. I have a get name, I have a get value, a get width and a set value. These are all uh, synchronous calls because uh, you need to know that the bus output is stable before you initiate another operation. You cannot do it asynchronous. At that low level, there is no asynchronous. It has to be synchronous. 
Uh, I have some callback functions here. I hope uh, people understand Gen Server. But effectively, it's a, think of it as a generic way of handling process on each board. So I have get name, get value, get width set, and stuff like that. And finally, there's a terminal that which makes sure that the bus is terminated at the end of the process. Okay. So, uh, I like to test things out as I go. So I, I decided to start with a AL, a one bit AL, write test for it, run, write test for a full adder and so on before putting things together. This is where I come into some of the nitty gritty of our life. So let's take a look at some of the tests. How many here are familiar with Erlang? How many have used EU? Okay. Uh, I come from, or rather, I use TestNG and JUnit at work. And coming from those two, EUnit was a root thing. Uh, EUnit swallows your debug message. It just swallows. It. So if you want to have a debug output, you have to use one of the macros that EUnit has defined. Which means your source code will be populated with macros which come from the testing. I find that unacceptable. That's like, hello, this, they are supposed to be separate. Uh, this part, the setup and teardown, took me a better part of two hours to figure out. Because you have test generators and testing functions and blah, blah, blah. And uh, while the online documentation is sparse, I was able to find some good help from Learn Yourself from Online. It's a website called Learn Yourself from Online. It's also a book. So let's look at a test for ALU. When you start an ALU, uh, you create all the wires. Wires are essentially one bit buses. You create the wires, they have names, and then you create a ALU and you tell the ALU that uh, these are the connections that are there. These are the wires. When it comes to a 32 bit ALU, it becomes more complex, but this is it. After that, you run it through a bunch of operations. So these are the operations that are permitted and uh, you have the results at the end. So you ensure that you have a INV, AAV, and a blah, 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 and you ensure that for each operation, the ALU is returning. Okay. So uh, somebody suggested using expected equal to actual, that is your pattern matching in Erlang. But that works, but the problem is that in the absence of uh, assert, the tests are not counted. So if I want to know if I have written 700 or 800 tests or whatever, I can't unless I use a question mark. So if anybody knows the author of the unit or if anybody is willing to contribute, this is an area which would make a programmer's life much easier. The second observation, as you move on to higher bits, 32 bit, whatever, Erlang makes binary and bits reading very easy. But surprisingly, bitwise operations are lacking. You get bitwise operators, provided you're willing to work with integers. You don't get any for bit strings and binaries. So if I want to flip all the bits of a binary, sorry, you write a function. Not that writing a function is difficult, but I was surprised to find that given that uh, the language originated in the telecom domain works with binary executable, this would be the top. These are some of the things since I had to write a custom function. I actually wrote a small mini library called bitslib. I'll show you that. This is my miniature library for uh, bits. So effectively, you have adding two bits. You have uh, adding individual bits, adding bit strings. How do you do a two's complement of a series of bits? Uh, how do you invert the bits and so on? Practically, everything is uh, implemented in terms of equivalent functions. This works. There's no harm in it. And it's a good exercise to go through. But when you come to serious bit punching, you probably don't want to go through a bunch of equivalent functions. You want to have an operator which will do it more efficiently at the beam level. I use spec in lieu of static types. One of my Haskeller friends looked at it and very triggered very business. But anyway, this is all I had to go with. So I wrote a bit of typing. I'll show you that part. 
uh, these are my types they are incomplete so interesting part you have uh, you have a binary value which is 0 or 1 you have a bit pattern a bus can only be modeled as a process my width is one of these numbers I have a connection and I have a list of connections that's essentially the all of it <coughs> it works uh, for some value of works but it's not particularly pleasant Dialyzer is slow for my liking. I would like my type system to be checked with every build, every test, and so on. But if I attach dialyzer to my build process, I can't run it like every two minutes as I want. So now let's look at the data path. We get into some more interesting terms, okay, area. These are things which happen in the sequence in the electronics. But if you send a tick to every component, you can't ensure the sequence. So I was initially I started with the naive idea that I'll have a tick and a talk and it's done. But no, you have to break it up into different signals. The first signal will set up whatever. The second signal will tell the buses to get loaded, and the third signal will actually tell the ALU to do something. So because you cannot have a single signal which is interpreted in different ways. Otherwise, your uh, you know code handling becomes uh, very rough, and you lose all the advantages. Uh, so, okay. these are the ALU functions. In, interestingly, I found a bug in Tannenbaum's listing in edition 4. So, let's come to the bulk of the code. Yeah. So this is my 32 bit ALU, or rather, test for the same. I have, I took the time out to write all the 16 functions listed there. So you have the first function which computes A. Can you see? Can everyone see here? Here the first one is compute A, compute B, A plus B, and so on. These are my test cases. The data for the test cases. Make tests out of this if you run. This is 32 bit ALU modeled as a process. Uh, in essence, it gets all these signals. These are the control signals. So it has a list of connections. The connections are effectively, it's a list of three buses plus uh, the control bus that is attached. You have an A bus, you have a B bus, and a control bus which tells it what it is. You break it down uh, shift left, eight, arithmetic, right, blah, blah, blah. I have chosen to model the ALU and the shifter as a single unit. Because to me it made more sense rather than to have a few different calls. So this is an ALU. Also, it, it also has a built-in shifter. It will shift the result inside those two. Now this is brilliant. I don't have to worry about finding out which bit does what and so on. I can just unpack it and take it forward. So basing based on the decoder combinations, I do A and B, A or B, not B or A. Of every bus here, uh, let's scroll down. Let's look at uh, A and B. So this is uh, yeah. A and B. There is no zip width for uh, bit strings. So I had to write my own because you have to take one bit at a time from two bit strings and then compare them to find out what is happening for uh, the A and B or the A or B. So this is what all it is. Now, let's go back. This is the micro instruction format. It has about 36 bits to compute what happened. So unpacking this in Erlang was a cinch. You probably saw something similar to this in Francisco's speech earlier. So that's my micro instruction. I can break it down in any fashion I want. Then take it, uh, send it, send these signals to other components. So this part is easy, very easy. Uh, setting up a process with state, easy. Bit Munji, not so easy. Uh, I wanted to cover a bit more, but there are time constraints. So this is what I want to do. I want to complete the ISA level architecture. It's still a work in progress. Uh, I would like to complete up to assembly level. I want to have a rudimentary UI to actually visualize the data path and stuff because I feel that that helps people to understand. So, if you have 
have other ideas or questions when I'm here and we are hiring you know Erlang and if you want to work with India. Thank you. I have I've chosen not to model them at the moment, but uh, in my notes, what I've done is you have effectively a way to delay delivering a message or you have ways to delay acting on it. So when you initiate a component, you can very well give it as a, as a property of the component because it's a process to tell it that, okay, delay your responses uh, by so many units where those units are your propagation. But strictly speaking, uh, what I see is that propagation delay, uh, it makes sense to model it from a learning perspective. But otherwise, I'll just skip it and go to it because I have a finite delay in terms of execution. I have to wait for the signals to propagate. I need to get a, a signal back from the bus saying that, okay, the value is changed. That itself is not efficient. Thank you. 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 I would like to put a delay built into the component and which you can configure at runtime saying that, okay, delay sending or responding to your messages by so many milliseconds. Oh, yeah, yeah, I went through that too. In, in, in fact, I was, uh, I looked at their HDL format uh, and I started passing it. Then I came with my own equivalent. Uh, I'll show you a thing I wrote. So this is my poor man's version of a full ladder, which I've written out like this. I have a simple passer for this. It's very simple. So you have wires, you declare all the wires, then you declare the internal wires, then you connect these. This has evolved, you know, it's still evolving. Ideally I'd reach like I'd like to reach a point where I can parse their HDL files and then uh, in fact that's where that's where I started. I looked at that, I liked their idea, I looked at the Java code, found it interesting. But then in Java, you have all these difficulties. With, I mean, they have to, they actually jump through hoops to accomplish some of the things which happen like this. In a it's, a, it's a nice beginner's project, yes. 